you are part of the browser. You're extending the browser experience. People often don't think about it that way. They think about it as like, uh, well, I'm just changing the theme on that website. Y yes, but you're, you are doing things that like a website wouldn't, you, you're part of the user agent. Hi, my name is Patrick Kettner. I'm a member of the Chrome Extensions DevRel team. To my left is friend and colleague Oliver Dunk, another member of the Chrome Extensions DevRel team. And my right is Simeon Vincent, co-chair of the WECG, the Web Extensions Community Group. Simeon, thank you so much for joining us here today. Here, I'd love to talk more about web extensions but before we dive into it. Can you introduce yourself to the folks and let us know a bit about you? Sure, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, for uh, four, four and a half years, was working with the Chrome team as a developer relations engineer. Um, I'm currently working on a browser extension focused consultancy, um, incremental software. And I'm also uh, uh, contributing to uh, Firefox. Uh, I'm working with Mozilla. Um, so yeah, I have my hands full with a lot of stuff these days. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's something that um, we've, uh, uh, you know, coming as I'm somewhat newer to the extensions team, we've been able to uh, talk a lot more as you are the kind of the, the expert of being a co-chair of the standards group or the part of standards groups, web extensions community group. Um, it's been really uh, eye-opening experience, at least for me, uh, how small a lot of the community is for something that so many users, I don't know almost anyone that uses the Chrome browser or Firefox for that matter, that doesn't have at least one extension installed. Yeah. Uh, but the development system and even like just the people that work in browsers on the different extensions, it feels like a really small ecosystem. Is that yeah. something that... Oh, I you strongly identify with yeah. that. It is um, a, a surprisingly small and kind of tight-knit community. Um, it, there aren't a whole lot of places where extension developers congregate. And that's actually something I'm really interested in trying to expand and develop over um, the next year or two. Uh, I want to start working on, you know, getting more community group or uh, uh, community events together and actually having uh, people talk to each other about how they build things, what their considerations are, et cetera. It is a, I feel like software in general is a really small ecosystem. Um, and then each niche within that is kind of a, a subgroup. Um, before working on the web, I was uh, working in the video game industry. And that was definitely a community where uh, everybody knows each other. You see each other at uh, GDC every year. Um, you know, good people, their names get around at different companies. And the browser space honestly feels like that, but even smaller. Mm. Um, and then web extensions within that are yeah. an even smaller group. Uh, so one of the things that I, I really like about the uh, web extension community group is I feel like we're very collaborative, that we talk to each other a lot, that we're very open to discussing ideas and kind of working through things. Um, and and that, that smallness of that ecosystem, uh, I would love to get more people involved, but at the same time, uh, it I'm really appreciative of the people that we have. and. You know, they're, uh, well, that's actually a great call yeah. to action. So for folks who might not be aware, could you actually explain what the WE, what the community group's model within the W3C is actually? Yeah, it's, um, I'm, I'm not like the, the biggest W3AC expert, yeah. but um, the community group model in the W3C was created in order to enable uh, interested parties to be able to kind of much more easily uh, talk to each other and kind of explore ideas. Um, much more easily than a working group. So working groups in the W3C are kind of the standard um, s standards group. It's that the standard standard body. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so they, they actually produce specifications and uh, standards that are agreed upon by and, and browsers commit to. Um, community groups are not empowered to create standards, but they are empowered to create technical reports, mm -hmm. which are basically a, a formal way of saying we can write docs. Right. We can write things that other people can then talk about and reference and potentially include in a standard spec. Gotcha. And it's so, been going, I was gonna no, say, it's been going yeah. for two, maybe three years at this point? Yes, I, I should know exactly when we were, <laughs> when we started because I was one of the founding members, but I don't recall off the top of my head. I think this is our, we just wrapped up our second TPAC. Uh, TPAC is the W3C's annual conference mm -hmm. and it has a terrible, name. It's like Technical Plenary and Advisory Committee. <laughs> but just think of it as the time when 
people working on web standards get together to talk to each other. Yeah, so all the, all the different browsers, uh, there are things like banks for that are interested in the payment APIs, or anyone that is really invested on the web uh, gets together at some location all around the world mm -hmm. uh, every year and talk about how to make stuff good. And that's something I think a lot of folks, yes. especially that might only hang out on like Reddit or Hacker News, might not be fully aware that we meet with people from Mozilla, people from Apple, literally every week, explicitly the extension team, and talk about what is going on with Manifest V3 or with any other random API. Mm -hmm. TPAC is literally just uh, a little like summer camp where all the people get together for a week. Uh, all three of us were just in Seville, Spain right. um, la last week. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah. Um, as the chair of the, of the committee, co-chair, co thank you so much. <laughs> uh, don't want to forget Timothy from Apple. Of course. Um, as the co-chair of the WECG, uh, you were kind of one of the de facto leads of that group a lot of the ways. You, you help organize and lead the discussions. What all did we cover at TPAC? Can you share like what was decided? What yeah. Was uh, we, we covered so much in such a short amount of time. It was actually a little bit of overload. Mm. Um, so before getting into exactly what we Please. covered, uh, we had a, a total of four hours scheduled to talk, and I think we spent like 25 hours yeah. talking to each other. Yeah. Um, so every day getting together uh, wherever there was room to be able to sit right. down and... Having a six hour pre-meeting meeting. meeting. <laughs> yeah. In some cases, that, that's yeah. kind of how it came out. So um, we got through a, a decent amount of stuff in the... Who's the we actually? Is this all yes. Googlers or...? Uh, so the we in this case, the participants uh, working on meeting and discussing web extensions in this conference were uh, myself, so currently unaffiliated officially from the, the W3C point of view. Um, we had engineering representation from all three uh, major engines. So uh, WebKit, Blink, and I never know what to call Firefox. I should get better at that. Uh, Is it Gecko? Or? Gecko, yeah. yes. Um, so we had representation from Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, engineering representation specifically, uh, we had DevRel participants. Both of you were there and, and engaging in conversations. And we had um, a couple of different browser extension developers that were present. And, and I think um, special thanks to them. They gave a lot of insight and context that uh, can sometimes be missing when you're laser focused on you know, how the internals of a browser work. Mm. Getting that additional context of, but that feels weird <laughs> is always really important. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that um, I think is really undervalued by a lot of folks that haven't worked in a browser is how kind of starved for feedback a lot of extension or a lot of browser you know, engineers are. Yeah. Like we, we work on a problem, uh, we work on a new API, a solution, something for a you know, month, if not years at mm -hmm. a time. And you maybe have a handful of people that give you feedback on it. And then eventually maybe you get hate mail once it actually launches. <laughs> like it, it takes a long time to actually get people's opinions to come through. And yes. the more we can get that from the community, the better, you know, like being able to Absolutely. try out new stuff earlier and tell us how to think is. Now, that's actually something I wanted to talk to you about. You yeah. were on, when you were on the team, I believe you and Oliver met before Oliver was on the team. We did. And Oliver was a part of an extension company. Um, do you want to give a bit about your extension background, actually? Can yeah, sure. So the transition? I was working at 1Password as an extension developer. So that was really interesting, sort of seeing the challenges that extension developers have. And like I worked very closely with Simeon. Uh, especially with the migration to Manifest V3, mm -hmm. sort of talking through our feedback and trying to sort of pass on our challenges. And you gave lots of great advice, both like passing that feedback along when it was relevant, but also just showing us ways of doing things that we hadn't considered. And I think that's where the communication is really nice because yeah. sometimes there are solutions and like just talking things through like brings those out. Yeah. In in the world of um I really like developer relations because you have that opportunity to directly help people explore um, ideas or, or work through challenges in a way they might not have seen. Because the experience of thinking about how you build your extension is very different than the experience of thinking about how people build extensions or what is possible. Um, so that, that kind of experience, I, I really enjoy um, working with developers to talk about their problems and, and work through them. And um, that's something I'm actually really excited about. Uh, I'm, as I'm working with Mozilla, my uh, primary focus right now is on helping extension developers bring their experiences to Android. Oh. And 
I think oh, that's right. Uh, Mozilla just announced that they're uh, going to support uh, add-on extensions or add-ons uh, on their mobile devices. That's yes. really exciting. I'm I am super excited about yeah. it. Yes. So is that is 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 there feature parity? Like, is it something where in general extensions on the web can in general go to Android or? Uh, by and large, yes. Um, there there are some differences. Uh, the MDN documentation has a, a nice table uh, that actually shows kind of which specific um, platforms and browsers. Uh, support what APIs. Um, so th there are notably some differences, but I think the key difference that the average extension developer needs to be aware of is um, extensions on Android support uh, event pages, but not persistent background pages. And persistent background pages are the typical model that people um, you have historically used when so developing extensions. Classic like invisible tab where everything's running in yes, the background exactly. in an extension. Yeah. yeah, and it's kind of like the coordinating, you can think of it like a central dispatch that everything is coordinated through or like the brain of the extension. Um, but the, the key difference here is that an event page is started in response to an event and then will be terminated when it's no longer needed. Oh, so it's not persistent the way that previously it was just exactly. always there in this time. And the reason I'm assuming is performance or like what is the actual? Um, as I understand it, the, the fundamental challenge on Android is uh, its process model. Mm -hmm. That an Android application can have a single primary process. Mm -hmm. And then if it has secondary processes, those can be reclaimed by the system, potentially even while that application is in focus uh, due to memory pressure okay. or in CPU pressure and other uh, constraints. Mm -hmm. So in order to keep the device responsive, Android may kill your other processes. And, and this is critical because previously extensions are running in the same process as the um, rest of the browser. Mm -hmm. And if a website is compromised, if you have a zero day vulnerability and they're able to escape the memory space of that kind of one, uh, one origin's capabilities, it can potentially, the, the attacker can potentially do anything they want mm. <laughs> inside the, that memory space that's shared between all the other um, either websites or extensions, which means that a compromised extension um, could do something bad or worse, that a website, a compromised website could get access to extension capabilities, mm. which are already above and beyond what a, a browser would normally give a website. Right. So, it, it is super important to be able to have extensions running separate from web content. Mm -hmm. And that, that primitive um, is only now coming online for uh, Firefox on Android. So you mentioned cross-browser extensions. I think that's a good opportunity to sort of pop the stack and go back to TPAC. Uh, we had some really great discussions there. I'm curious, do you want to share some of them? One that I'm really excited about is some of the discussion we had around moving to the browser namespace as the way for APIs to work across all browsers. Yeah, and that, that seems like a relatively subtle so or unimportant. Do you want to summarize what that is, actually? Yeah, yeah. Like, so the short version is that uh, Chrome, since it introduces its extension model, has used the word Chrome mm -hmm. as the global namespace for extension stuff. And Firefox, when they uh, created kind of the web extension platform, uh, when they implemented Chrome's model, they didn't want to use Chrome because they're not Chrome, yeah. obviously. Uh, so they used a generic name, browser. And that, that fundamental tension of which global do you use to access all of the capabilities of the platform has been something that has just kind of been a, a stumbling block for folks since there began this alignment about, around this common model. Um, and we made a lot of progress on kind of talking through the set of problems and challenges and how to actually just make browser the thing that works everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like a, you know, it's going to happen next month kind of thing. It is a, like, this is an ongoing conversation and we need to perform some, uh, do some work in the web extension community group, open some like pull requests on other specifications, but we can see the destination on the horizon. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think when you have, yeah. it's funny working on the scale of web browsers, when you have billions of users, <laughs> it's really hard to break the internet. Like we need to make, be very sure yes. that when we're shipping code that it doesn't completely break something. I mean, there was famously the array method that broke MooTools, I want to yeah. say, like a few years ago where it ended up breaking tons of websites and those websites were never going to be touched. And so as a part of 
introducing a new global namespace on the web, our, us, uh, Chrome, need to make sure that that doesn't break a whole bunch of random websites. Yeah, that, absolutely. Know, people in Slovakia need to file their taxes or something like, it, there's a ton of due diligence. And so something that seems and is very simple to implement ends up taking months, if not years of research. Yeah, I, I think that's the subtle bit that it's very easy to overlook that it does take a long time to make sure that we're dotting the I's and crossing the T's and performing the right set of tests. And, and yes, we're very confident that we're not going to break anything by doing this, by removing something or adding a new thing, uh, both of which can potentially be major stumbling blocks. But I'm very excited that we made a lot of progress there and hopefully, um, actually I have no idea about a timeline. Do either of you have a sense of when? No. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's nice that we made some progress. I think there's still a long way to go, yes, and we'll, we'll see how things we, pan out. But. We, but I think our team was able to confirm that we can ship it. Yeah. And I think anyone that's worked at a large company or development in general knows that 90% of the work can sometimes <laughs> making sure you can do something before yeah. you actually ship it. So it's definitely much sooner than I would have originally <laughs> anticipated. I I'll, don't mean to walk back your statement. Please. We, may be able to ship it. <laughs> yes, we, we know that it's not an impossibility. Right. Yeah, we have confirmed that it's not impossible. Um, and that's a huge win yeah, <laughs> a lot of times. Absolutely. Uh, getting back to the question please. about what we covered in TPAC, so talking about the browser namespace, that was uh, a huge one. We dove into alarms uh, in trying to make the behavior consistent across all browsers. Mm -hmm. um, there are some weird discrepancies that have come up in the past couple web extension community group meetings. Yeah, alarms was something that was surprising as a newer person out of the group here yeah. to extensions. Like uh, I think uh, historically when I think of extensions, I think of web development. And so mm -hmm. if I want to run something at a random time, I'll do set timeout, 10 minutes, run the code. Right. But we can't do that with extensions, right? Right. Uh, so I think there are two considerations. One is uh, the difference between an event context and uh, you know, a persistent execution context. As long as a, t a web page is open, as long as you have a tab open, you know, the, the set timeout makes sense. But if you have boundaries there, uh, potentially the browser closing and starting up again, or the, uh, the background context for the extension going away and coming back, then a timer no longer, uh, a set timeout no longer works. Right. You need another mechanism, and that's where alarms comes in. Yeah. It's an, an extension specific API to get notified about some work that you want to do in the future. Yeah. It's a part of the web extensions platform that works in Safari, in Chrome, in Firefox, right. et cetera. But there is, it's at a high level, it exists, but at a very low level, there's all those different differences that end up biting people occasionally, and we were able to iron out some of those issues. That... Yeah, so one of the kind of surprising things that I didn't realize was an issue until it was brought up in the web extension community group was um, Safari, when they began adopting the web extension platform, they implemented alarms different than Chrome had. Mm. Um, notably, I believe, <laughs> I believe the summary is, and please correct me, um, Safari was using wall clock time. So effectively, the system clock, whatever your computer says the time is, that's what they were using to calculate when an alarm should fire. Mm -hmm. And Chrome had kind of more of like a, a relative time passing system. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was possible for some weird things to happen where if you shut down your laptop uh, and then say you schedule an alarm to fire in one minute, mm -hmm. you close your laptop for two minutes and then open it, what happens to that alarm that you had scheduled? Right. Um, the behavior was inconsistent across browsers. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of forced us to come back together and say, but what should it do? <laughs> yeah. Wait, we, we know what Chrome does, we know what Safari does, but what do we want the What's the correct thing for the platform? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that we talked about at TPAC was agreeing that wall clock time is probably the right way to solve this problem. Um, and more broadly, having it behave like set timeout and set interval do on the web also probably makes a lot of sense because that's what developers are coming from and what they the behavior that they're used to working with. And that actually, I would say, if we were to try and like pull out a theme from TPAC, <laughs> I think that was one of them was like. Let's embrace the web APIs. Yeah. Yes. Let's try and stay as like true to that platform as we can, mm -hmm. and only deviate when we need to. Yeah, uh, that was a major through line. No, I, I, it's been really encouraging. I think to see how much investment there is to to do the right thing. Yeah. a lot of extent. Like when it comes to the web extensions platform, I think all major browsers, uh, all minor browsers, even the ones that don't that use other engines, um, are shipping. They 
want the extension to they want the extension ecosystem to, to thrive mm -hmm. and to exist for a long time. And so we need to make a whole bunch of decisions like this to make sure there's not weird random bugs that end up hitting people. One of the very interesting considerations to me about the difference between the web platform and the extension platform is the constraints are a bit different. Um, ideally, we want things to be able to, uh, an experience that somebody provides in an extension to be able to last as long as possible, mm. but browsers are constantly under development and the capabilities of browsers are constantly changing. Unfortunately, we are less of a fixed target than the web is. Mm. The web keeps adding capabilities but doesn't get rid of old ones and we don't quite have that same luxury on extensions. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about and I'm interested in exploring is how do we responsibly evolve the extension platform in a way that minimizes the amount of change and the amount of pain that it causes developers mm -hmm. while still enabling us to move forward and advance things that may require breakage. Sure. So it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I feel like you and I have actually talked about how to evolve the ecosystem over time. And specifically, mm -hmm. I think we were both a real big fan of uh, Ember, the JavaScript uh, library, how yeah. they handle releases. Yehuda's done a really amazing job there. Um, as a co-chair of the WECG, <laughs> you could, in theory, help steer all of the web extensions to that model. And I think it'd be great to share why you think that is a particularly attractive model. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of slaughter, or the, I'm not going to do a great job of uh, summarizing how their, their approach works, but in essence, um, when they introduce a new capability, they add a new method or namespace or whatever to the, the Ember framework in parallel to the things that already exist. And then when there's a, when they make a breaking change, when they move from two to three, say, uh, they essentially cut off all the things that have been deprecated and only carry forward the things that are kind of the intended platform for the future. Uh, and I find that approach really interesting and I'm kind of surprised that more people don't do it because it does very much embrace this idea of we're constantly moving forward, but we're gonna give you as long of a runway as we can mm. to help you transition. Right. And also in that time, uh, prove out the new thing is actually better than the old, mm -hmm. uh, provide documentation, migration guides, and give people enough runway to successfully transition. Responsibly evolving a, a platform is a genuinely challenging thing, but I, I, I'm really, I, I've actually reached out to Yehuda and talked to him a bit about how, how they work, uh, and I have some documentation I need to follow <laughs> up on in terms of better understanding their process. Um, but I, I do kind of expect that I will, in the not too distant future, mm -hmm. um, write something up, share it with the web extension community group, and, and kind of suggest maybe this is a model that we want to think more about formally embracing. And to add some context there, I think yeah, one of the things that has us all thinking about this is Manifest V3. Of course. So we had the transition from MV2 to MV3, which was the newest version of the extensions platform. And I think we all generally agree that there are things that went well, but also a lot of things that could have gone better. So I'm, yes. I'm curious, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you saw developers facing? Mm. And how do we try and make future changes better for developers. Mm. Yeah. Will they always be as painful as the last five <laughs> I years? Hope not. I, certainly, I certainly hope not. Yeah. Um, I, in the Web Extension community group, I definitely want to talk more about how, how we evolve things and, and how we approach new, new capabilities and, and platform evolution in order to minimize that pain. Um, but some of the things that have been challenging for extension developers is uh, moving from a persistent background page, which is, I think, the vast majority of the community uses use that as their fundamental model to service workers. Um, so not only are you transitioning from persistent to event-based, you're also transitioning from a page context to a web worker context. Mm -hmm. And that is a very critical difference because right. so many web capabilities are exposed on the document object model on DOM. So many APIs that people use, like integrating with the clipboard or, uh, I don't know, back forward uh, navigation, those are exposed on DOM, not like JavaScript APIs. And essentially what web workers have access to is like core JavaScript APIs plus a little bit of extra. So there were a lot of capabilities that weren't directly available in service workers. And um, over time, as developers were running into issues, the, the Chrome extension platform needed to kind of evolve in order to make things easier and, and have additional grants, uh, make, make things possible that wouldn't be otherwise. Um, so I think the, 
the particular capability that I want to highlight in this context is on the Chrome extension platform, there's a new capability that came on, I think, within the past year. Mm. Um, I don't remember the exact timeline. <laughs> Please correct me if you recall. Which? Uh, Off-screen documents. Uh, Chrome 107. 107. Yeah. Yeah, that's not that long so that's ago. That's for it's uh, about almost a year, a little under a year. Good um, memory. <laughs> that, that was quite impressive. <laughs> yeah. uh, Off-screen documents are critical here because it it provides a document context where you can continue to use those web platform APIs and makes it possible to communicate between that and a service worker and and for the off-screen document to have a lifetime independent of the service worker. Um, so it's still not persistent. It's still kind of event-based and related to a particular job that you're trying to do. But critically, um, it it doesn't have the same lifetime concerns and considerations as service workers, and it has access to those web platform APIs. So you mentioned lifetime concerns. Yes. I feel like one of the things that our team has struggled with the most in the last five years that Manifest V3 has uh, been going on mm -hmm. is communicating why the changes were going on, mm -hmm. what we were actually um, addressing. I think one of the biggest ones is really around performance, yes, also absolutely. security and other things. But performance is especially impactful with background pages. Yes. So um, what was the issue with the background page performance-wise, especially coming from someone focused on mobile extensions now? Yeah. Um, so obviously, these days I'm thinking about uh, Firefox and Android and the, the especially constrained environment there. But I think there were similar concerns on the Chrome team um, where people are using Chrome on a wide variety of devices right. with a wide variety of capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get a pretty low-end Chromebook and, and it still has to be able to do all the stuff that Chrome does. You know, unbound number of tabs that are being interacted with unbound number of extensions that the user has installed, um, and ultimately a constrained performance budget of how much you can do per cycle. Right. Uh, and I guess in more limited number of cycles per second. <laughs> to some extent, you, you two are formally the, the better equipped to answer this <laughs> than I am. Um, but my understanding of a, lot, of a lot of the constraints were that because you had persistent background pages, those are essentially fully active tabs um, that exist in parallel to what the user is currently interacting with. Mm -hmm. And browsers do a ton of optimizations in order to minimize the amount of work that they're doing at any given time. Right. So like freezing background pages, throttling them, uh, sorry, background tabs. <laughs> yeah, uh, like if you had a loop them. running every half a second on a page, if you switch it so you can't see it, it might slow it down to every five seconds. Yes. Every, and that just improves battery life. It makes sure that other processes aren't being interfered with it or anything like that. But yeah. with a background page that's a, effectively a fully tab that's yes. invisible, you can't optimize those the same way. Yes, and, and that, that constraint, be, because they're expected to respond instantly mm -hmm. and have open ports with all of the different pages that they're communicating with, it, it, people don't think about it this way, but basically every extension you have installed is another open tab that's visible to the user at all times. Mm -hmm. And they're not visible. We're, they're not visible, but yeah. it's, it behaves like from a performance point of view, from a browser engineering point of view. It's, it's as if you had a tiled set of windows and you're only interacting with one, and that's the one the user thinks is their like, current tab, but you still have to deal with all of that resource consumption. And that is hard. <laughs> it's very hard to optimize that away. And there are compounding factors that uh, each extension slowing things down 10% could get it's an exponential growth yeah. easily. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that. I think we're all kind of power users of extensions. I believe I've cracked a hundred recently of stuff <laughs> that are installed, and obviously we're you know beyond the edge case. But uh, you know, if you have five or ten extensions, which is really common mm -hmm. for a lot of Chrome users, that those performance issues can really add up quickly. Yes, especially when a lot of extensions are built by hobbyists who aren't necessarily considering you know the biggest impact of performance over time. Um, yeah. It's, is something that is kind of a double-edged sword of extensions, right? You're incredibly powerful, but with great power comes great responsibility. Certainly. I, that's, I think, one of the really interesting things to me about the extension space is you are part of the browser. You're extending the browser experience. And people often don't think about it that way. They think about it as like, uh, well, I'm just changing the theme on that website. Y yes, but you're, you are doing things that like a website wouldn't, you, you're part of the user agent. For and sure. all of that, responsibility of being being performant, properly handling user data, making sure everything is secure and safe, you now take out that responsibility. And that that is also challenging to do well. Absolutely. I mean, there are people that spend their entire careers focused on that yeah. space. I mean, like you said, we're 
theoretically some of the biggest experts for Chrome <laughs> extensions. And it's uh, kind of scary how much it, you can still learn every day. Like there's so much there. And especially I feel like a lot of the partners we work with, the uh, mm. developers of, you know, some of our individual people, some of them are huge corporations that are entirely focused on extensions. Um, they have a lot that they can teach us. We were lucky enough to have Excellent. some join us at TPAC and give their, their guidance. And um, actually, the off-screen document, like you mentioned, I feel like yeah. it was a direct result of feedback from the community. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that, that gets back to we, we on the Chrome team at the time thought that we had kind of a right set of trade-offs and capabilities. And as people developed on it, and as they experimented with it and tried to build things, they could concretely say, no, this isn't working for us. And then we went back and said, all right, how do we make sure that it does work for you? What do we need to do to extend and enhance this. Right. And I'm curious, actually, you yeah. mentioned off-screen documents. Um, we've also made a number of other API changes. I feel like I'm definitely seeing that developers who previously struggled to migrate to Manifest V3 are finding that it's now easier to do that and that more of the capabilities that they needed are present in the platform. Does that match what you're seeing? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think one of, a, one of the big constraints there early on was, I mentioned before, service worker lifetimes. Yep. And there's been a ton of work that Chrome has done to, to kind of relax the hard limits that were in place and make it easier to have a set of work uh, execute and for your extension service worker lifetime to extend until you're able like, to kind of responsibly shut down, uh, which is fundamentally different. Before, there was a five-minute hard limit. No matter what you were doing, at five minutes, you will stop. Yep. It's kind of moved to almost a magic show now where it feels like, <laughs> in general, I feel like extensions and really all of the web platform mostly just wants to do what's intuitive to yeah. end users. And with service workers, for extensions specifically, I think the whole purpose is that they're there when the developer wants them to be, and they go away when they're not. It's yeah. that kind of perfect balance of uh, utility and performance. And the five minute limit was wrong <laughs> on that. It was something that we were able to iterate and learn with feedback from the community too. Yes. It's something where, you know, when you're making a browser engine, that's the perfect browser engine, but it's not necessarily the perfect browser engine for users. So um, if there's one takeaway, yeah. developers, feedback is critical. Absolutely. Please tell us what we need to do better. So I'm lucky enough to have your phone number. <laughs> how do they do that though? I'm assuming we're not gonna put that on the screen right now. Oh, sure. So how do uh, folks actually <laughs> contact you or us or anyone else? What's the best way to get feedback on extensions? Yeah, I, I would actually defer to you two on how Chrome prefers to receive feedback these days. Sure. I mean, we can do a round table. I mean, personally, sure. I don't care if it's, you can put my phone number up, we can do smoke signals. It doesn't matter. We're, like I mentioned before, we, we're starved for feedback. Like, mm -hmm. we do get feedback, but it could be 10 times as much, and it still doesn't feel like it would be enough. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, it's, you know, when there's so many APIs that people are literally building their livelihoods on, that if they're struggling against it, like if they have to spend an extra week to, in order to do every release because of some kind of problem with the API, they could have literally talked to us 10 years ago <laughs> over lunch, and that might have completely changed. Yes. Like, it's really, really outsized, the amount of, it's like an avalanche effect. You know, throw a pebble, and by the end, it's a giant snowball of impact that people can have. And so personally, however they can reach me, my name's Patrick Kettner, literally every social media contact, please <laughs> contact me directly. Uh, that's how I feel personally. Like it doesn't matter how you do it, get it to us. Um, I think scalable wise, the the, the, <laughs> the, mail, the mailing list, the uh, Chromium extensions yeah. uh, mailing list is sort of the de facto extensions communication. Uh, it's the, definitely the best way to stay up to date with mm -hmm. what's going on on the platform. Um, yeah, was there, a, do you have a particular way you like to get feedback from the community? Yeah, I'd, I'd call out a couple of things. Um, in terms of changes on the platform, we have the known issues page, which you can find on developer.chrome.com. That's a great place to keep on top of things. If you find an actual bug in the platform or you have a feature request, then uh, just the Chromium bug tracker is a great place for that sort of thing. Yeah. Crbug.com. Uh, yeah, crbug.com, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then the Web Extensions Community Group. I think that's a, a really nice place for specific feedback that's more about the ecosystem uh, that the warrants discussion across browsers. Concept of extensions. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, actually, yeah. how do you think about that in terms of <laughs> the distinction between a bug that should be filed against a browser or a bug that should be brought to the community group? Yeah. Um, so in the case of things like inconsistent behavior, where one browser implements a particular set of behaviors and another browser has a slightly different uh, or slightly inconsistent approach, um, I feel like that's good that's good content to discuss in the web extension community group because maybe it's not clear from the platform what should happen. And we need to discuss that amongst the browser vendors and figure out how to proceed. Um, 
I think if there is something that clearly doesn't work as documented in the browser's documentation, in, in particular, um, focusing on the difference between um, MDN currently has a lot of Firefox more specific content, um, which is something we're trying to make more generic. And uh, developer.chrome.com has a lot of, it has Chrome's official documentation for what the APIs are and how they should behave. If you uh, found inconsistent behavior with uh, what's stated on developer.chrome.com, you would open a bug on Chromium's issue tracker, CR bug. Um, and that is a great way to, to tell browser vendors that that thing doesn't work. Of course, please search, make sure that you're not um, duplicating existing issues. Uh, but once you've verified that you know, nobody else is talking about your particular right. problem, open an issue and... Yeah, it, it, it's the... the, uh, the the better formed feedback is, the more exponentially helpful it is to yes. web browsers, like having specific test cases if there's a pro platform problem, um, having specific links to documentation bugs, special test cases as to how they're blocking. Test cases, I think, from my point of view, are like one of the most critical things that you can oh, do. That's Being able to see... Makes it easy. A, a reproduced demo of exactly the bug that you're talking about, as opposed to saying, go install this extension, now navigate to some particular submenu. It's much harder to figure out what the problem actually is. Right. I think the idea of starring a bug is also worth talking about. Absolutely. So if you come across a bug that's already been filed, it's really tempting to add like a comment saying plus one or this affects me. And as much as we appreciate those, it adds noise to the bug. Yes. So there's actually the ability to star a bug. And not only does that keep you notified if there are updates, but it will also like increase a counter for us. And that's a really useful metric to see impact. I think yeah, whenever we chat to the engineering team, if we yeah. can say, this bug is the most starred bug in the bug tracker for extensions, that's a really compelling case for, we should look at fixing this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think anyone that looks at the bug tracker for Chromium will see there's bugs that are almost as old as Oliver. <laughs> like it's, it's a very, there's a, a lot on there. It's kind of a Sisyphusian task to, to address. Uh, and so by its nature, it's something that we constantly triage. We look yes. at every bug that comes in. And some of those bugs that are 11 years old don't get touched. But sometimes when it ends up impacting folks in a way we didn't expect, then all of a sudden that priority goes from a P3 to a P0, or P1. Uh, and so starring a bug is one way that helps our team, or any browser really, I mean, the, uh, whether it be WebKit, Chrome, or uh, Firefox, it helps us properly prioritize what's important to the community. Because yeah. the whole point of web browsers is for web developers. In terms of sharing feedback, mm -hmm. um, I, I think as we were saying, uh, browser-specific issue trackers are great for bugs in weird behavior in a specific browser. I think the web extension community group is great for thinking about the platform as a whole or um, talking about things you wish you could do or things that are not as ergonomic as they should be and coming together as a group, group all of us as a community, to talk about how we move things forward. Right. Because ideally, web extensions work the same, like the same way that a website, if you have a website and you open it in Firefox, you don't expect it to be different if you open it in Chrome. Right. We want web extensions to be the exact same thing in general. Mostly. Mostly. Yes. yes. Obviously, there's differentiation, speciality of each browser. But in general, the dream is that basic extensions would be great to be interchangeable for the most part between browsers. We're not quite there yet. We're working towards it. Sure. And if we bring feature requests to uh, the WECG uh, rather than individual browsers, there's much more likely that kind of we all get improved at the same time. That, that actually brings up an, an interesting angle about kind of web extensions and the, the ecosystem. We're a bit different than the web in that we don't have 100% compatibility. Right. Um, or there, we don't need as much agreement on how to move things forward. Um, and I think that is an area that we need to explore in the web extension community group, how we, how we approach allowing browsers to differentiate and expose browser-specific functionality, but also how we evolve things in the same direction and reduce those inconsistencies and incompatibilities over time. Um, so that, that's getting back a, a bit to how we were talking about um, evolving the platform and making breaking changes. That's one of the things that I'm thinking about and really just need to carve out time to write up a bunch of words and um, put it in front of other people and say, does this make sense? And if not, then how do you have any other ideas on how we could approach it? Yeah, no, I mean, that's really all it is. It's getting ideas down and talking about them, getting feedback from people, from the community, mm -hmm. saying, is this what you want? 
because I feel like a lot of times with new APIs, new features, they might be completely different between browsers, but conceptually at a very base level, they can be the same. Like we were talked about before having a new API for new tab pages, so that if you had a replacement for a new tab page in a browser, you could have access to, like uh, Firefox has the pocket uh, articles that exist at the bottom of the page. Uh, Safari has all kinds of like your recently read articles or other widgets. Um, is there a way that we could maybe bring those to extensions so that custom tab pages could have them and be able to have the same user experience, but you know the color you want to, your custom backgrounds or whatever they want to do. Yeah. Just give the extension developers the way to make the best experience possible for users. And that's something that we want to make sure that we're not like uh, hurting any of the browsers. We're not making or taking away anything that makes them special, but we're actually you know celebrating the things that make them unique and yeah. something in a way that we don't necessarily focus on on the web platform where we want kind of uniformity. Extensions we can make each platform the reason people like that individual browser all the better. Um, and that's something that I think is really kind of unique about web extensions and exciting to see it thrive so much. Yeah, I, I think that is one of the things that I also really like about this platform is um, making the browser you love better, whatever browser it is. We've spoken about bugs. We've spoken just now about feedback. Uh, one thing that I know engineers would love me to share mm. is like, please test across different channels that each of the mm. browsers has. So I know like on Chrome, we have like Chrome Canary all the way through to Chrome Stable. Firefox, I think, has similar with Firefox, Firefox Nightly. Nightly. Mm. And then Safari has Safari Technology Preview. Yep. And getting feedback about things that aren't working as a developer would expect in earlier channels is it gives us a great opportunity to, to look at those things. And like sometimes if we have a new API, like for example, having access to new information on the new tab page, mm -hmm. then getting feedback on that before we've shipped it in stable is yep. really useful. Absolutely. It's the best time to be able to change something. And, yeah, and especially even for existing stuff, testing your existing code in those dev channels, because occasionally there are breaking changes. Like recently, uh, Chrome, I don't know if you saw, deprecated. Or, or bugs. <laughs> yeah, or bugs, all the better, yeah. Like Chrome recently deprecated WebSQL. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's no longer available as of Chrome 119, I feel like. And there's a handful of extensions that actually use WebSQL inside of it for a database, uh, effectively. And all of a sudden, just didn't work. But and we do try and catch those ahead we, of time. We but did. We're not perfect. We, proactively, <laughs> we did proactively outreach to all like 1,092 extensions that happened to use Web, uh, Web SQL, And we were able to make sure that that didn't happen. But if you weren't pre-testing things, you just wake up one day and your extension will be broken. Yeah. And then at best, you would be able to get a fix in for the next version of Chrome, which could be two months before it ships, and that's a lot of time for your users. If you're building a, a job out of this career, that's huge. So just testing early, giving feedback early is really, really impactful. Absolutely. And you can make sure that while the engineers are focused on it, they can continue to iterate. I, I think it's also worth noting, sometimes people think it's not worth providing feedback because nobody's going to pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, but as you were saying, browsers are very interested in hearing Absolutely. how things are going. It all gets seen. Like, yes. we, we have to prioritize. We, yes. we do get a lot of feedback about particular things. Um, like you said, some things we don't get enough feedback. Some things we maybe get too much feedback. <laughs> yeah. But definitely just follow the feedback, and then it all gets seen, and we can like triage it and decide how to prioritize. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we don't always have time to reply to everything, though I think we have a bit more of a luxury on web extensions that we are able to, to be a bit more engaged than other parts of the platform. But in general, Every single thing that anyone files a bug on Chrome, some human is reading it, if not several dozen or several hundred. <laughs> you know, it's something that everyone looks at and really does shape things. If we can point to actual use cases saying that this API is broken for these users, mm -hmm. that's huge. That can actually change how we plan the next quarter, the next year of work. Absolutely. You know, it gets something that really is impactful. And please, please, <laughs> just give us feedback. So I want to circle back real please. quick to um, providing feedback. Uh, the Chromium Extensions Google Group is a great resource. A lot of people, a lot of extension developers are talking to each other, and Chromies are talking to the community about the platform and how things are evolving. Um, I, Web Extension Community Group is a great place to talk about um, kind of the future of the platform and uh, lessening inconsistencies and the direction that we're trying to move things. Um, issue trackers for the individual browsers are a fantastic resource for reporting individual bugs on those browsers. And uh, I guess on my bias, the, the um, Firefox side, uh, the Mozilla Discord, or Discourse, mm. the Mozilla Discourse is a great place to share uh, feedback and, and talk to other 
uh, extension developers. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and it's um, really something that is, again, incredibly impactful. Like, get involved and give us feedback, and it can really change the way the web works, I feel like is really the case. Now, completely shifting gears, <laughs> um, something that I feel like was kind of the, the hot topic for a lot of TPAC across all the groups, not just extensions, was the impact of AI on the web and mm -hmm. how that'll actually interact with stuff. I think extensions are particularly suited to sort of be the the default platform for a lot of AI interactions on the web. Like in apps, you can't add AI to random apps that you're using. It's true. You have to add it to the operating system. Yeah. You know, on the web, there's no other platform that's so ubiquitous that anyone can create an extension that just gets injected on any piece of content. Um, do you think there is a deeper place within extensions for AI? Like, is mm. that something that could be added to the platform, or is this more of a service-based thing? Is it something we go to our bards, our chat GPTs, mm -hmm. using you know remote APIs? Um, yeah, what's the future look like with extensions <laughs> in AI? I'm, I'm not going to prognosticate too much because this isn't my particular area of expertise, but I do, I do think that there's uh, a place for local models running inside extensions. And I think that there are um, there's potential for the platform to better accommodate those use cases, to have capabilities that are targeted to being able to load a model or quickly rehydrate it. Um, and I think that's worth exploring in the web extension community group and among individual browsers. Um, I think there's also a really interesting opportunity uh, for extensions to call out to these kind of services, to BARD and ChatGPT and whatever else folks are working on. Um, because you can do things with a data center that you can't do locally. And, you know, that's the story of the web, right? But um, I do think that there's unique opportunity for both to integrate. Um, my personal interest in having the, the local stuff is offline capabilities. Yeah. Uh, uh, meaning, like the local stuff, meaning all AI happens on the device. Yes. Like all or, of the, or using an extension to ex enhance your web browser and add some AI features. Mm -hmm. That if you have a model that can cross multiple pages, and um, and that extension is able to inject into the different websites and kind of synthesize data from across multiple sites uh, on behalf of the user, uh, and ideally with the user's consent and of understanding. There, I think that's a really unique and interesting opportunity. Mm. And the, the trouble is, uh, I think it can be a bit challenging right now with the set of APIs, how they exist for the platform, what the, what the extension platform allows, that um, you're starting up the model potentially more than you want. Right. Um, so it's, it becomes a more expensive operation. It's tricky, though, because um, these are large, complex pieces of software yeah. that are working on constrained environments. You can't keep everything in memory at the same time. So there, it, it feels to me like there's opportunity to explore what we could do there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it goes back to what we were saying with like uh, testing out stuff and getting early feedback. Because yeah. it feels like with all the AI stuff, we're kind of at the similar to the, the early days of the web <laughs> when there were so many things. And that gave us the, the DOM, like you mentioned, which was a terrible API for a lot of times. Like a lot of stuff was just shoved there because it could. And that's kind of an example, in my opinion at least, of an API that's not great. Uh, we've slowly evolved over the last 30-ish year, 35 years away from it. And I certainly don't want to see that mistake repeated with AI, where we've rushed to get a bunch of APIs just to have them immediately. And then sure. we end up spending you know, a quarter century trying to undo our quick mistakes. Um, I'm really excited to see the, the growth here. I hope you know us on the WECG can come with something that we can bring AI to, to the web and web extensions. Um, though I am also really interested in what the community, what folks out there think. Is there something you're looking for from the platform with AI or with anything else that's missing? Um, let us know. It's a good chance that you could actually tell us what we're working on next year. I think everyone's heard the stories of like somebody using an AI tool to like write an essay for them yeah. or even to like help them write code. Have you like fallen into that? Uh, group yet, or is it still something <laughs> you haven't explored as much as I've you'd done like? A little bit of experimentation, not too much with um, actually having having it generate tons of content. I've mostly used uh, AI tools to uh, try to seed my own creativity and um, introduce other directions that I might not have thought about otherwise. Uh, but yeah, for me, it's been mostly kind of a starting point or very early on, as opposed to like. I'm going to now use this to scaffold my entire blog post, and then I'll just tweak a couple words to make it grammatically correct. Yeah. yeah. 
You know, it's funny. I, the, my default assumption, you know, as someone that's very passionate about developer relations work, is uh, how can this affect our job? Like, how can we make the web better? How can we use it? And so I think the default assumption, I think a lot of folks on our team, was to ask it questions about web extensions or whatever yeah. they're working on <laughs> and judge its answers. Like, is it good? Is it bad? And it was funny how many times there were um, the uh, hallucinations that were coming through. And I feel like that's something that's going to be um, a real area for our team and for all developer relations and for standards groups and everything else and how to maybe properly train models so mm -hmm. that when developers look to them for uh, their co-pilots or other developer tools, they're not giving completely incorrect information where it seems close enough to reality to where it just leads them down the wrong path. It's something where I don't really know how we're going to address that. <laughs> and, but like, I guess local models are things where they're actually focused on individual things. Maybe a Chrome extension documentation model could be something that could help people. But it's something that, again, I'm really excited to see, but also uh, really interested to what more people are thinking about on this. I, I think what really excites me about that is that uh, I think often these models make the same mistakes that we all do. Yeah. Sure. They're using the same information. They're trying to come to the same conclusions. Absolutely. And so I think rather than our focus being how do we create the best AI tool, which I think is something that uh, is going to happen regardless and we can like mm -hmm. take from the community, uh, I think we should just focus on let's make sure our documentation is answering the questions that people have. Absolutely. And like if we can do that, then hopefully the models will have the information they need and everything else will follow on from that. Yeah, it's definitely an exciting time. I'm not scared yet, <laughs> I can tell you that much. Yeah. Um, I would love to keep going, but I think we're actually getting close to time. So uh, before I completely cut you off, is there anything you want to share with the folks at home, uh, how they can get more feedback or how they can contact you or anything else? Yeah, um, if you are new to browser extensions and are looking to get started, um, my previous experience with the Chrome team, I'm very biased. Developer.chrome.com is a great resource to learn about building extensions as is uh, extensionworkshop.com, the kind of Firefox-specific uh, website to learn about the platform. Uh, MDN is a great resource. And I'm very excited to explore um, keeping our, our data, uh, the web compatibility data up to date. Um, great TPAC conversations there. We mentioned the Web Extensions Community Group a number yes. of times. How do you get involved with that? Uh, so you can join the Web Extensions Community Group by visiting uh, w3.org and uh, searching the community groups for uh, Web Extensions Community Group. Web Extensions is one word. Um, and once you join, then you can uh, add issues on our uh, GitHub repository and uh, help us join in uh, adding tags and modifying content to make sure that we're up to date. Um, we try to keep a uh, in GitHub issue on the on our GitHub issues. <laughs> uh, you can also participate by creating issues on GitHub and uh, adding topics to the agenda to be able to discuss it in our subsequent meeting. We try to keep a, a agenda issue pinned on the repository. That way, it's super easy for people to jump in and, yeah. and all, contribute. All browsers and other par external partners meet every two weeks to talk about uh, yep. whatever is on the agenda. So yeah. And if you join the group, you can attend those meetings. They're mm -hmm. open to Absolutely. everyone. That's all it takes. Yep. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Simeon. I look forward to talking to you again soon. And I look forward to sharing another video soon as well. Have a good one. <laughs>